you're doing something that nobody else is doing. Everything you do is totally different. Like, how can this be? Because we have the best caterers in New York. They're all in here and we have never seen it like huh. this. And then she's like, you've shrunk in miniature comfort food. You've done this whole thing. I was like, I have? They're like, yes, you have. I was like, oh, cool. Welcome to The Wedding Biz with Andy Kushner, the show about the global wedding business and your backstage pass to the happily ever after world of professional dream makers. I gave you my heart on a silver platter cause you made my dreams come true. Hi, I'm Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz. If you're enjoying the show, please help us to continue to grow our community by sharing the show with your friends and colleagues and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts from and follow us on Instagram at Wedding Biz Show. And once again, spreading the word is really the best thing you can do for us. So thank you. One of the topics my next guest and I talk about is the importance of building the right team and letting go and trusting them. And I want to take this opportunity to recognize the powerful team behind myself and the show, The Wedding Biz, and that is our marketing and social media director, Melissa Hagen, and editor and podcast consultant, Christy Hausler. I feel so grateful to have both of them working so hard for the show, and there is so much coming down the pike. I am just crazy excited. So today's guest is Peter Callahan, owner and creative director of New York City-based Peter Callahan Catering. We met in his office in New York City, and my conversation with Peter was electric. He definitely has a very special perspective, not only on the business, but also life as a whole and how he lives it and approaches it. He leaves one hell of a cliffhanger at the end, and I, for one, am going to keep a close eye on him. Peter is also just too humble to mention that he runs a very profitable business, something not everyone who seems so successful has been able to accomplish. Peter talks about how to scale and the need to let go of control, the concept of building a team and partnerships, managing the balance between the creative artistic side and the business, the importance of making and taking time for yourself, which leads to even more creativity, and we talk about so much more. Peter's tenacity is, is evident and and his openness in terms of his overall attitude and perspective has led to amazing epiphanies for him and being innovative. And, and Peter has been widely credited with having created the concept of miniaturized comfort food hors d'oeuvres, such as the slider. And that's just a small part of his story. Peter is so passionate, and I thank him for making himself an open book on the show. You are in for quite a ride as the conversation builds and builds. Peter's energy is infectious. And I left his office inspired, and I know you will too. Meet Peter Callahan. So, Peter, you are the owner and creative director of the New York City based Peter Callahan Catering, where we are today. You have been a caterer, food stylist, and culinary innovator for more than 25 years and have been widely credited with having created the concept of miniaturized comfort food hors d'oeuvres, such as the slider. You have a best-selling book called Bite by Bite, 100 Stylish Little Plates You Can Make for Any Party, and your most recent book is Party Food. You've appeared numerous times on The Today Show and Martha Stewart Show. You are also a contributing editor for Martha Stewart Weddings, and you've created events not only for Martha Stewart, but also Vera Wang, Kate Spade, J.P. Morgan, Valentino, Tony Bennett, Kelly Ripa, Google, many, many, many others. Uh, I mean, this is, this is pretty impressive. Vader, you have quite a career going. I'm curious, were you particularly passionate about food as a kid? Like, did this manifest in some way when you were really young or in your family? Yeah. So, Andy, I was when I was a, a kid, I was the middle child. I have two sisters and my mom was a great cook. And, you know, I cook with her all the time. I think it's like in your DNA. Like I literally would uh, just wake up in the mornings on the weekends and start like baking things. This and, is when you're like a little kid. How old were you? Do you yeah, remember? I mean, like, you know, uh, preteens. Yeah. Wow. And uh, and. I really got into it. And so I've known how to cook from scratch my whole life, sort of maybe with an emphasis on baking. I really got into baking. I had like, you know, a sourdough culture going as a kid. <laughs> what? A yeah. cult, sourdough culture, you yeah. just said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's, you're right. into it. In the crock on the windowsill. And then so, 
you know, I went off to college, went to a liberal arts college. Which I, one? So I went to Hobart. Okay. And I, you know, grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. My father was a corporate bond salesman for life on Wall Street, commute to Wall Street. And for lack of imagination, like everyone I knew went to Wall Street. So I did the same thing. But in college, you know, most responsible kids or even semi-responsible at least went to some classes, right? <laughs> okay. I was the guy that didn't go to class. Wait, like what, like a party guy? Is that what you're oh, saying? Yeah. So I was literally, and we share? threw great <laughs> parties. I yeah. had a roommate who was from the Midwest and his family had like a gentleman's farm, yeah. Arabian horses, and then all the different divisions. So he would get like a whole pig, you know, a quarter of a cow and, you know, and we had it all at this house that we lived off campus at, at Hobart. Yeah. And then we had like, you know, Pouli Fousse wine and just everything. Trader Vic's like hot buttered rum mix. This guy, Nick, was like, you know, <laughs> he had it all wired. A, I didn't have the money. B, I didn't even have the imagination. Nick had it all. But then we would together just throw the most unbelievable parties. And that's what I did in my undergraduate. I threw parties, man. And I didn't, re no one realized, including me yeah. or my parents, that this was my training. That's that crazy. was my education. Right Jeez, then. I wish I had been there so I could uh, partake in the food and everything. <laughs> we had amazing parties parties. And that continued through my whole illustrious multi-college stop tour. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, Hobart after a couple of times said, uh -huh. goodbye, we're done with you. Oh, like literally bad grades and stuff oh, or, no or behavior like issues? The professors would literally come before finals and be like, Peter, you haven't been to one class. Come on, man. You need to study. And my father, <laughs> you know, who's kind of an earnest guy is like, I know you won't get any work done in your houses or your fraternity house. He'd pay for me to stay in a hotel. And so I would supposedly be sequestered, but like, you know, I was a case. So <laughs> this is know. crazy. Yeah. So what did you do like job wise or did you not really? So I went to the commodities floor. So actually my roommate's older brother was a floor trader on the Comex precious huh. metals, like visualized trading places when they're like down the floor, yelling and screaming <laughs> love that and spitting in each place. That's what I did. Wow. And I was a clerk down there for the largest precious metal trader in the world. Huh. We made the markets in gold, silver, copper, platinum every day. Jeez. If we bought, the markets went up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I was, you know, you're really poor as a clerk or you're a trader and you're not poor at all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I gave my notice, my boss couldn't believe I would do that because like it was a, it was going to be a very good thing. Oh, you were on your way in terms of I was of on my path. way and he, I, so I was 26 years old when I, when I gave my notice, I'd been there two and a half years. He's like, what do you mean you're going to be, start a little takeout food restaurant? He's like, you're going to need a restaurant and a racing stable for tax write-offs. <laughs> I'm like, Mel, when though? He's like, I don't know, punk in like two years. I was like, Mel, I can't wait that long. And he literally thought I was going to be like, it, like, you know, one of the big, his big competitors on Monday. And he goes like, you'll be fired on Tuesday. Cause I run this place. I own it. And he did. Wow. Yeah, he ran it's crazy. That place. But wait a minute. But if, if you're doing that, I mean, I understand. Well, were you doing this because it was kind of in the family in terms of your father selling bonds, being in the finance market? Oh, like, no. Why like, did you go that way? He got me jobs at like First Boston, you know, not jobs, sorry, interviews. Inter yeah. And I went into the white collar places and that was just so not me. I didn't, we didn't understand each other. Yeah. I was not a white collar kind of job kid. Uh -huh. You know, the Comex being very rock and roll, that was much more fitting for me i don't know why it's just the way i am you know it's in my dna and uh but yes it was finance because that's what i sort of grew up in yeah okay so then it seems to me that it's an enormous amount of courage to make a leap like that or or do you just not think like that you know what the thing is is that until you're presented with the opportunity where money lifestyle what interests you uh -huh. you don't really know what's the most important to you. Mm. And so that became evident and it wasn't really evident at the time. I just didn't even think about it. This is what I did. You know, you're making me think cause I, not many people know this, but I sold for IBM coming out at 21. I mean, I graduated Boston university. I got a big sales job, IBM. I had a big territory DC, you know, as a 
kid. Those were good jobs, well, by the way. Yeah, Those and, were very well, good and jobs. And the training back then, I, t- I was one of the last ones to do the big nine-month training program. So That was the, the best there was. Yeah, right, right. It was like the Harvard. The thing is, I at that time, I'm like, I want to be president of IBM. But within a year, like you're kind of talking about, the money and everything, it wasn't feeding my heart. And I was like missing the creative aspect of it. And it sounds like you growing up, because what you're talking about with baking and cooking, it's not just cooking. Like it, to me, it's artistry, right? So it's, it's like, I'm, I'm assuming that was kind of pulling at you that you missed that. Well, so here's a cool thing. So in my period in college where I was every parent's worst nightmare, <laughs> my mother brought me to a place called Johnson O'Connor in New York. Uh-huh. And it is an aptitude testing place. And it's super cool. You go into a different, it's two days and they test you on lots of different stuff. They hmm. bring you into a different room. It's very expensive. Like one room's the Egyptian room. Another one's the Persian room. Another one's the, you know, the, the Greek. And, and they test you for stuff. They don't ask you questions. They just test you. Yeah. And, um, they, they, after this said at the end of it, you're unbelievably creative. And they said, you know, what's your outlet? Are you a musician, an artist? What is oh. it? And I was like, nothing. Huh. And they, I said, how do you know I'm creative? Yeah. And they said, because whatever anyone else is doing, you do the opposite. And I was like, that's creative. They're like highly creative. I was huh. like, cause I thought that was just being difficult. And they're like, no, and they're like, you are so off the charts creative. And they're like, if you don't have an outlet, they said, how do you do in school? And my, and my mother through like gritted teeth said, yeah. why do you think we're here? <laughs> and, uh, uh-huh. and so and so they said, because if you don't have an outlet and you're as creative as you are, you are going to create major mischief. Wow. That is one Boy, of the- did they nail you. They nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what sparked the idea for you. I got to do something different. No, it didn't. I sort of forgot that they said I was creative. <laughs> you know, I was kind of a thick skulled kid, like, you know, but when I started my catering in the beginning- I, I was not creative at all. I had not one creative idea, but part of it was I didn't know anything about catering. So my dad said, well, son, don't you, you should go work for glorious foods in New York. You know, they're the best oh, catering Sean, and learn right. and learn the business. I was like, no dad, I'm 26. My life has passed me by. I must start it now. <laughs> and mind you, I, so I started this takeout food shop and you know, not well thought out. Cause like the more food I sold, the more money I lost. Like people were like, you should, you've got two of them. You should have four. You'll drive a Mercedes. I'll be like, no, I'll be in debtor's prison. Yeah, yeah. And then like a very influential woman decided I was going to be her, one of her pet causes and that I was not going to go out of business. Okay. And well, so she saw something in you then. I had an espresso machine, cappuccino machine <laughs> okay. back in the eighties when it doesn't even exist. Okay. And she's like, he's cool and he's young. He's a nice guy. And I'm just, she was very wealthy and influential. Her name was Penny Wyke. She was spectacular. Sounds like and a she, social life. And she lived in a house called Toad <laughs> Hall and it was an English country estate. And I learned catering in her house. That's interesting. Sounds like a Harry Potter uh, thing, dormitory or something. Yeah. So you learn catering, but how so? What do you mean? Well, so the first party, she'd say, oh, Peter, just bring a little <laughs> some of these things over from your cafe. And I'm just having some friends over this Sunday. And we went to her house. We'd yeah. never seen it before. We went, you know, through the garage into the kitchen, didn't see the rest of the house. And she said, oh, we use this china with this and this silver that. And da, da, da. I'm not writing anything down. I have no clue. Uh-huh. But we had our menu. And the waitress walked into the dining room and she literally, she dropped. She had like, you know, one soup plate in each hand. Yeah. And she like, her fingers open and the soup oh. plates drop. And she goes running by the kitchen. She goes, what is going on? Go look in there. I am not walking back in that dining room again. You did not tell me it would be like this. And we walked <laughs> in the dining room and they were literally like South American dictators in full colors. Yeah. You know, her husband's in white tie. It is like, you know, the most high powered group that's yeah. on earth for this small little dinner. She's right. Doing. And uh, so we had to feed her shots and get the girl to go back out and serve them. And, you know, it all worked out. And that was the start of a long relationship. Wow. Oh, that's crazy. So based so what happened next? So 
After that, we had another mentor. Okay. Her name was Happy Randolph Shipley, the whatever. That is and so she, cliche, and she was, that name. And Hannah Randolph, uh-huh. first name Happy, and she was spectacular. Same thing. Was she happy? <laughs> she was very happy. Okay. She had a great life. Uh-huh. And she, again, made it her mission that I would not go out of business. Yeah. I owe my start to these two women. Wow. And then after her, I had a guy named Peter Rohrer, uh-huh. who was from this very old family in Philadelphia. And he, his, but his parents were caterers. Mm. And so he ran special events at a, at a museum in Philadelphia. And he was like, you'll never make any money until you start doing large corporate events and big dinners. I was doing smaller things. Jeez, that's a totally and, different thing, And though. he's like, and you're going to work in a museum. We have to set up field kitchens. You're huh. not going to have a kitchen. I'm going to teach you wow. because no one else is giving you a break and you're, you're at a, you know, and you have to get into this level. So again, I owe so much to these mm. people that made it their thing that I'm going to help this kid out yeah you know at the key stages yeah you know you but still i mean you're being humble about it but obviously they saw something or they sensed something in you yeah probably that i was just clueless and i need help (laughs) (laughs) all right so now this is what your mid-20s upper 20s you're talking about at this point yes exactly sort of uh I was 26 when I started it, and uh, by my early 30s, I mean, we were, we were going. You were going. And, and yeah. like, can you tell me more about that? How did that manifest? How did you make that jump? I understand that you got help, but what is it that led to, like, you know, now you've got a legitimate, successful, earning, profitable business, you know? So, I mean, it, it turned into that really with the support of people like that. And those three people were really almost single-handedly responsible for it. It's a cool story. And uh, because we became then the, you know, preferred caterer at the Academy where we did at the Academy of Natural Sciences, where we did almost every single event because we knew the museum, we did the events for them, you know, at very accommodating prices, then they would hook us up with the corporate clients that would come in, the conventions. Then there was a second one, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, same thing. But I would come in and partner. So we would do whatever we need to do for them. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was, I had one insight that, you know, these people are being really good to me. This is a really good opportunity. So whatever I can do for them, I'll do. And we always did that. And so I, at a very early age, had two exclusive contracts where I was the in-house cater for all the events at two of the best museums in Philadelphia. Jeez. And when, when that, before that really existed mm-hmm. and the next person that had the most was a much bigger care that had just one. Mm-hmm. So I sort of catapulted to the top at a very young age and it was going great, but then it sort of became, you know, Philadelphia catering is extremely competitive and it was sort of like, you know, really all became about how well do you run a business? Mm. And it was very busy. I was divorced. I had a young son. I'm not from Philadelphia. Okay. I'm a New Yorker. Okay. Mind you, that's <laughs> I get it. very different down there. Right. And so <laughs> all of a sudden I had sort of my aha moment, you know, I don't know. It was around like 90, 1993, 94. I'm like, Okay. From a lot of people's point of view, they're like, you're a huge success. They thought I was making a lot more money than I was. Mm. And I was working super hard. Yeah. And it also just wasn't interesting me that much. But the one thing was people would come down from New York Mm -hmm. and throw parties and they would go nuts. Mm. Like they would do crazy stuff. And like, I was like, that's fun. That's cool. And then I did the old... I had to, uh, you were mentioning something in your own life too, that I spent one summer that my family had a house in Nantucket. I'm like, I'm hanging out here more. Uh And so I tried to run my company from there, which didn't really work that well. Yeah. And, but I made time and space for myself. And I basically said, I'm going to recreate myself, man. And I said, and I said, and that having that time and space, I'm like, I'm going to go back to where I'm from, New York. Mm. I don't know how. I'm just going to do it. And I want to become the best caterer in New York. I want to be, and I want to only do the best parties and have fun while I'm doing it. Right. Key thing, have fun and enjoy life more. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I do resonate with this because I mean, for myself, you know, I'd mentioned before, you know, I went to Maui for five weeks at one point a year ago, a year and a half ago. It took a lot to be able to get to that point. Scary as hell, but it was taking that break, right. And kind of self-nurturing to then have 
all these epiphanies go off. And, and yeah, I kind of recreated, started this whole podcast business while I was there. I mean, I get it. So did you close down the Philadelphia office or how did you manage this structurally? So what I did was, um, I, no, I still kept Philadelphia. And one so you just, key, op- yeah. And one of the key things was, is that I opened in New York basically without an office, without huh. a kitchen. So I had zero overhead because I had all that down in outside of Philadelphia. Well, it's I'd, not that I'd, far away either, it's right? It's not that far away. Yeah. It's 90 miles. So I had a you know, 5,000 square foot production facility uh-huh. down there all built out. And so I could pick and choose the events I wanted to do. And so it's sort of like when you put out into the universe, this is what I want to do. Yeah, right. Stuff starts happening. So so you didn't directly necessarily promote in New York City or like how did that go? How did you start to get the business then? Well, so I, I go to Nantucket uh-huh. and I grew up in New York. So I started telling my friends. Just telling people. And people I would meet, yeah. hey, I'm, you know, I'm now catering in New York. Yeah. And so I had a guy I met through a really good, a really old good friend of mine who was head of Daimler Benz in New York. And so Stefan right away started using me for all Daimler Benz's events. Mm. And we did lots there. And then I also did meet my current wife, okay. Josephine Sasso. Uh-huh. And back in the day, you would get your wedding gown at Vera Wang mm-hmm. and you would get your mother, the bride and bridesmaid dresses at Josephine's. Okay. So I met Josephine in uh, 1996, uh-huh. and we were married three months later. <laughs> Why am I 19- not surprised the way you are? Engaged, <laughs> or engaged, mind you, engaged three months later, okay. and married. You know, the next, the next, summer. and you're still married, and we're still married. Awesome, yeah. So that opened up unbelievable opportunities mm. because she was mega connected. Huh. All the planners knew her, uh. and. You know, she and she was very social and she knew a lot of people. Yeah. So all you have to do is wander around New York with someone that's like that and be like, hey, I'm a caterer. Oh, you are? Really? Call me, you know? And, right. But you had to get through the door. And, and you still have to come through. You got to come through. So I got the access. And then what I really did was like, you know, for each event, I would just overwork on it. Like I would just work mm, on it over, over and over, deliver, and, over like, and then yeah, over deliver. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I was off and running. Yeah. Wow. Well, all right. So I want to ask you a few details here. I, I I read some things about you, and one quote I saw, which I'd love to get into. You you said that you believe food and parties should be quote visual and conceptual entertainment unto themselves unquote. Can you say more about that? So when I first started catering, let's say in New York, okay, you know, food was fairly classic. And hors d'oeuvres were typically like different ethnic food from like there'd be a Thai, you know, like a lemongrass, coconut, Thai shrimp. And that was what's considered creative. And then trays were charger plates that had maybe like cinnamon sticks in the base or beautiful red pumpkin seeds. And they were all beautiful and very nicely done. And all of a sudden, when I was here in New York, and one of the coolest things started happening. Like, remember, I never had any creativity, right? All of a sudden, out of nowhere, man, I started having insane creativity. Huh. And the way it comes to me, yeah. it's like in an instant and it's a vision. Hmm. The concept, I see it in my mind and I'm like, holy cow. And so I started dreaming up all this super cool stuff. So as an example, a hamburger done mini like the size of a quarter yeah, like who that would had think never been done yeah, before right and when i did that people's reaction they freak they're like oh my god they were just because no one ever done anything like that huh and then like when you get a reaction like that it's like okay what else can i shrink now it's like uh, a grilled cheese but you know people had done grilled cheese they would cut them down triangles i'm yeah. like no man i gotta make mini bread ah, and with then the crust like, all around the whole thing yeah then you had to make the mini bread pan because mm. the mini bread pan didn't oh, exist oh and it didn't exist right and then you got to stalk your bakers because they're like <laughs> nobody baked that stuff in house like, yeah. so I'd go out to the bakers and they'd be like you're out of your mind beat it kid huh. and so I would like chase people around my, my commissary kitchen and but we started making miniature bread so we started making like mini hot dogs we started making you know, mini pies. We started making just shrinking everything. Wow. And so then I did a party uh, 
the, for Martha Stewart and Darcy Miller, who was the right hand. She's person. been on the show. Uh-huh. Okay, great. So Darcy, I did this party for Martha Stewart that Darcy was at. And she and everyone else was like, I just don't understand. Like you're doing something that nobody else is doing and you've got everything you do is totally different. Like, how can this be? Because we have the best caterers in New York. They're all in here and we have never seen it like this. And then she was like, You've shrunk, you've, you've shrunk in miniature comfort food. You've done this whole thing. I was like, I have? They're like, yes, you have. I was like, oh, cool. Because <laughs> I never really thought about it. We just sort of did, just did it. it. Yeah. And we never like set out to do it. It just sort of happened. Jeez. And we had made customized trays too. Because yeah. I was like, well, I don't want to see anything else. I don't want to see garnish uh, on it. Yeah. And we took acrylic and we just made clean trays. They were clear and they were white one or the other, and so that all you saw was the hors d'oeuvre. Huh. And we made them ourselves. And caterers would call us up from all over the country and be like, because we got all of a sudden we were in the press with her and everyone else. Like New York went crazy, man. Like they were, everyone was like, oh my God. Yeah. And so we never had a PR person. Like just everyone's just, calling and covering us. <laughs> this is a dream. And, uh, you know, and then caterers would call us up from all over the country. Where do you get those trays from? You need, we want to buy them. I was like, I make them. <laughs> no, you don't. That's ridiculous. Nobody could do that. And that's not right. You should share the source. <laughs> Click. And I was like, no, we make them, you know, but like, and, and, uh, and now everyone does that. You know, they go to people to have them made, but that started with us. And so all of a sudden people, all the, all, you know, the people that we would do a tasting for our party, they'd be like, Oh, your food is so witty. And I'd be like, it is? They're like, yes. It's like, what a sense of humor. You've taken macaroni and cheese. You've shrunk it down. It's got such a personality. It's whimsical. And they'd be like laughing, practically hugging over the food. Yeah, no, I get that. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. And so all of a sudden, like when you get that reaction, it's like, let's try to make more of this. Yeah. And that, you know, and you, you can't really force it because- you can't really come up with new good ideas, right? There's no such thing. I mean, you can't say, hey, I want something creative. You can try, but it doesn't kind of work that way. But all of a sudden, just randomly, the ideas would come Do you in. have any idea what the hell sparked this in you? Do you, you just don't know to this day? Well, you just so started I, have this stuff? Innate, I have an innate creativity. Yeah. But maybe everyone does. I don't know, right? They send the testing, though, that I had way more creativity. Yeah. But I think that I will say this, and this is a cool thing to say about New York. Okay. New York is a place that highly values parties Mm. or a certain group of people and companies or charities and private individuals. And, you know, they really are almost like, in a way, benefactors at times Hmm. because they give you the freedom, the space and the budgets to create and they want it. So by being in that environment, it's a very, it's an artistic environment and they value it and that fosters it. It you know what, fosters it. Yeah, you know, I was going to add to this because, you know, through the music side, I've done a huge amount of stuff here, not just, you know, the business I have, but also songwriting, a whole bunch of things here in New York. I've been here a million times. And every time I come here, it's, uh, there's a, a, a vibe here. I, I don't know what else to call it, but I am immediately inspired. I mean, it's it, it just immediately, you know, stepping out here. So there's just the whole environment of the city too. That's right. You know? Yes. So, okay. There's another, now I read in one of these interviews and I don't know if this still is something you would say, but you were giving what you were called a top tip, which is, uh, this is quote, focus on cocktail hour food because it's the first thing people taste. I find it's better to put your money there than, than on an extravagant entree. Past minis are always well received and people love carving stations with artisanal meats too. Really, sometimes I hear from guests, they're like, what you first are served and what you're last served in an event is what you remember the most. It makes sense. And, you know, mind you, a well-prepared dinner is essential. So that goes without saying. Okay. But, you know, what will really be the thing that they're going to remember is going to be the hors d'oeuvres and even the dessert hors d'oeuvres at the end. And you don't want to skimp there because Mm -hmm. that's something you have to have. Mm. Now, mind you, if that means that you've got to have for your entree, like a really well-prepared chicken, so be it, Mm. you know? By the way, there are great chickens that you can do. Uh-huh. Don't be like, oh, I've got to have the best New York strip. And then you cut down the hors d'oeuvres because it's when the party first starts and everyone's all getting together and it sets the tone for the evening. Mm. 
So how about, or let's relate this directly to weddings. Do you have any particular stories that works in, you know, everything we're talking about with a wedding client, you know, and what your process is with that? With wedding clients, you know, they sort of fall into two categories. One category is, you know, they want just classic hors d'oeuvres, which means it's not going to be whimsical and entertaining. And that's obviously it's all what they're looking to do. And we do that all the time. Then there's another one that's just looking for creativity and they want something innovative. And then we also do that really well. And then some, you know, Yeah. but I will say this, that often in a wedding, the people that are attending are, you know, you've got the two different families. There's often two different groups of people, both Mm -hmm. on the family side, the friend side, and they often have never met each other before. And so you've got a lot of strangers in one room. And when you come out with, as an example, our mini cod tacos paired with mini Patron bottles with margaritas. In Whoa. It, people, you know. It's a there, conversation there, there piece, right? The wall, yeah. You know, oh, and, I see. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, two people that may not know each other all of a sudden have something to talk about mm. and they're talking about. It. They're like, oh my God, look at this. What's in this bottle? This is so cool. And they're now, it's made a connecting point and it's fostered interaction among them. It's made people more relaxed. They're smiling because it's fun. It's all happy things. Yeah. And it actually does more than just feed the people. It creates a whole buzz. It creates conversation. It connects people. And it's super helpful besides just food. And that's the absolute coolest thing about the uh, about my conceptual food that I do. Yeah, no, I get this. You, immediately, I'm thinking, I'm starting to drool thinking about this. So I went to Maui again. It was last May. And it right. was the opening of a, of a, the Humble Market Kitchen, which is owned by Roy Yamaguchi and, and Shep Gordon, and some others. Yep. And they had what they call celebrity uh, hosts. Anyway, so I'm there and the meal was great. At the dessert table, you just walk by, get what you want. I was just, I had parked myself there for like 20 minutes, right? Nice. I just, and I try not to eat too many sweets, but I was going out of my mind. There was this other guy there across the table doing the same thing. We ended up, I mean, exactly what you said. We're both clearly just dying over what we're eating. We connected so much. Now we're friends, you know, we're hanging out and stuff, yeah. but it all came. Right. I don't know that we would have connected, had a chance to talk if it weren't for that shared experience. Yes. It's exactly that. Yeah. You, you know, you're, you're telling my story. I want to also talk a little about balancing the business and the art. I mean, you know, we've addressed some of it, but that for me, I guess for a lot of us, for artists, is such a difficult thing to do. Yet you have developed a successful, you know, profitable company. I I see out in the other room, lots of people working for you. You've had a lot of great success. How do you view that building a team, managing the team and, and again, balancing this, these two completely different skills, let's say. That's a very interesting uh, question that you're presenting. And, you know, truth be, I need to personally, and I encourage everyone to figure out, number one, how to do what you like to do and do more of that. Mm. And you talk about that with yourself. Yep. And as an example, the creative side of what we do is really what has created this my company. Mm-hmm. And I need to make far more time for that, which I'm actually working on right now. Mm. And it's something, you know, and it, it's, it's hard because catering is a challenging thing. You know, you have in one instant, you're prepping food. You've got to have your equipment there. You've got to have your design. You've got to have your staff. It all happens very fast. And there's a lot of pre-planning in it. It's a very competitive market. So it's, you know, you're getting your proposals out. They've got to be great. Just even get them booked. And so it's very easy to not really have much time for the creative side. Mm, sure. and, and it also, to a degree, all that business side of it sort of sucks the creativity mm-hmm. out of you. Mm-hmm. So partly like right now, I'm working on creating the team to take a lot of that infrastructure things off of me because what I should personally be doing 10 times more than I'm doing now, if not more, is creating. And that's number one, what I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. That's also number two, what is my best attribute. And then number three, that's going to create the business that I want. And to be honest, you know, I've created a lot but I want to create so much more. And there's another very interesting thing too, that 
when you start creating and working on those creations, that sparks more happening. Mm -hmm. So when you were saying, how's that happen? That's one thing. And so I do have someone starting on Monday yeah. who is among other hats they're going to wear, is they're going to be helping interface mm. over my creating so that I can do the really fun part. And then they're going to help just keep it moving along. Are you, and, a, yeah, go ahead. Are you able to let go of some of the controlling side of that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am, but partly it's getting someone who really gets it too, because it's very expensive often what we do. Uh -huh. Like I have one new item and I don't know, like the prototype, the first one's going to cost like two grand. So, mm -hmm. and I have been, you're right. Very savvy of you. You know, part of it's been, do I want to make it out of copper? Or do I want to make it out of stainless? <laughs> Does it need to have a drain in the bottom? Uh -huh. You know, you know, is the spike the right length? And it's like, you know, part of it is the clerical side. I can't remember what, what, the, what the last CAD drawing looked like. <laughs> right. But, you know, yes, I like to let go, actually, uh -huh. as long as it's all going to work out. So part of that is developing the relationship mm -hmm. so that it does. And my resolution these days is that I'm, you know, I'm not there now where I'm creating at all what I wanted, the amount I want to do, uh -huh. but I've got an absolute ironclad vision that I'm building uh -huh. a new company where that end goal is in a few years where I'm going to be able to be creating mm. and that that's going to be fueling my company and partners that I'm going to be having. You know, isn't it almost, it's a constant process of reinventing ourselves in a sense, because this is, I mean, yes, it's still Peter Callahan catering, but it's reinventing yourself in a, in a lot of ways, right? That's right. I'm excited because as an example, I've got some really great new ideas. I can't really share them because in our world, uh -huh, it's such right. a copycat world. <laughs> no problem. Those are the things that turn into my currency, right? Yeah. But I've got a lot of really great ideas yeah. and that gets me so excited. I can see I, the excitement in you. I, we're close to getting that stuff done uh -huh. with this person who's going to come in to help and just, you know, having a little, right. a little support with that. And that's the coolest thing because, you know, the great thing is, is that's what creates different realities. And, you know, it does everywhere in the country, mm -hmm. but because I've had this catering company in Philadelphia, but it really does in New York because they're going to, they'll compensate you for it. And so you really can, you can design and create as much as you want. And then the world comes to you, uh, you know, oh, and I love that's that. a cool, cool thing. Yeah, no, I love that. You know, you're all, and you're also talking though about uh, just to step back for a moment, choosing your team in a way that allows you to do this too, right? I mean, I know for myself. I mean, I had a team member who embezzled from me. I was horrible at choosing the right team. Now, whew, I'm ecstatic. I am. I, I mean, Peter, it's like I feel reinvented. It's freeing me up to just do the creative. I am so excited. So excited. And that's, I mean, that's brilliant what you've done. I mean, it's really brilliant. And I admire you for that because it is, that is sort of cracking the code. You know, you're, you obviously are a creative person and you've built a team to allow you to do it. You recognize in yourself that you're a controlling person. And a lot of business owners and especially probably creative too are, and I think we're our own worst enemy with that. Oh yeah. I know I am, yeah. right? But I'm sort of built a business. This is another interesting thing. Okay. So I set out to be the best caterer in New York. Uh -huh. And I think that on certain days that we are that, at least in the eyes of certain clients, right? We're not trying to be on the same level as the best other caterers. We're trying to be above them. Mm. And that's a cool thing because it then is saying that, you know, you want me or you don't. And it's not to be better. My, mind you, my other, my competitors do a lot more parties than I do. Hmm. Way more. And that's an incredible skill set. And they do it very, yeah, very- Yeah, to scale is a whole nother story. And they do it really, really well. Hmm. And that's not something that at the moment- Yeah. That I'm looking to do, but we're, I'm starting to move in that direction for certain things. So as I look at my legacy and where I'm going to go, uh -huh. I a hundred percent want to bring partners in mm. and I want to create more of what I do. And that's, you need to do that. And you've figured that out. You're talking about that with you, how you've been able to get good people mm -hmm. and create your future. And they do need to be partners. Yeah. They need to be like equity, profit sharing, whatever. No, you got to share in some and way. And so we're totally moving in that direction and fast. And 
as I do that, perhaps partly doing what I do at my level and what we charge, we're delivering a huge level of perfection. Mm. And the business of perfection is an interesting thing. And partly I want it to be amazing, Mm -hmm. but part of it's going to be that I'm going to have my designs and then other people are going to deliver it. You know, just like yeah, yeah, sure, that. right, and you know, and it's going to be what it's going to be. Mm-hmm. So, partly, my creativity is a very powerful thing because the things that I've dreamt up, the mini cod tacos and Patron, the mini burst, these things have all gone viral. They've gone viral all over the United States, mm-hmm. and like I literally did one party in southern India a few years ago, and within two years it changed the way every party was being done in India, for Mm. real, because Mm. it was that influential of family. So I have this idea that I should be able to, with all the things that I do, be able to create a much bigger footprint. And part of it is, though, you've got to have partners. I think that's one of the really key things. Yeah. And then I got to create more. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I got to let go more. <laughs> and that last one. And it's a tough one. I know. Trust me. The tough. Oh, yeah. But it's the only answer. But the interesting thing was just to back up. To, sure. When I started my company in New York, I modeled it after two to three people that existed. And they were event decorators. There was Rennie Reynolds, who basically created, you know, decor at events in New York. Mm. And there may, I think there was someone before him, but Rennie was a very big deal. Like Absolute Vodka, when they ran that incredible ad campaign in all the magazines, Absolute whatever, they would say a famous person's name and there would be, right. so there was a there was an Absolute Rennie with an Absolute bottle made out of flowers. Like he was that big of an icon. Huh. And someone like Rennie, I sort of fashioned myself after him. He's incredibly successful. He's retired from events now for mm-hmm. quite some time. And he did very well. But the whole business was Rennie. Yeah. Everything passed through his hands. Yeah. He priced every event. Oh. He was at every event. My God. And, you know, but that was his greatest success. But it's also your greatest weakness. Oh, I can't imagine. Your personal. Yeah. Right? I was going to say. And there was another two people that were the same way. Philip Balloon oh, yep, and sure. Robert Isabel. Oh, yeah. And so Philip was very much an alliance. Uh, Philip and I and a woman named Polly One, we had like just sort of, I don't, the word alliance is kind of weird, but we, we had a great relationship, the three of us. Uh-huh. And really the two of them helped me tremendously by giving me opportunities to be in front of the most extraordinary parties in New York. And, you know, Philip in particular, who had a big company, like it was all Philip. Mm. And that's how I made my company initially and yeah. that's to a degree how it is today but now we're working on building the team out right. and we're gonna try to let go a little bit uh. <laughs> <laughs> and move that in a direction that we could create something that's you know appropriate for a man of my years and what you might be able to do. Like, you know, I actually like to ski a lot. I'd like to ski more. Oh, you'd like to have some more personal time? I'll I might even you. like to learn to surf. Oh you know, you'd God. think with a house on Nantucket, I'd know how to surf. <laughs> right. You know, that, that's way cooler than not. Or actually, maybe it's going to be kiteboarding. I like kiteboarding. <laughs> well, that, okay, that's another thing. See, this is related to it is, ba- is I was going to say balancing personal and the business, but it's like having more personal time. I mean, same thing as I get older, I, not that I'm not having fun, but I, I just, I want the pace to be more relaxed. And you know, Peter, one thing I'm finding is that as I work more on doing that, I'm becoming more successful. Who would have ever thought, That's right? Phenomenal. Do you know what I mean? That's but you know phenomenal. what I mean. Phenomenal. I do. Yeah. I do. Because you, you're, you're forced to become more creative, more, more efficient, more productive. You, you're forced to have to take on, choose team members better and let them participate, you know, and in the fortunes. And, and it, it then allows us, I, I don't know, the more relaxed, the slower I go, the, the better ideas I get, the more effective I am on and on. Who would have thought 10 years ago? Right. You right. know? I think yeah. that's the biggest struggle a lot of us have. Yeah, it's it's very true. And uh and you've got you really have to sort of pick a path and stick to it, right? So it's sort of a plan and where you're going mm. and uh you know so and we also, you know, we're I'm working on, you know, I think that uh 
you know, I must say I get inspired, very inspired by people like Elon Musk, not necessarily by the yeah. hours he works, which is yeah. insane, but also like, I mean, uh, there's no book. limit to his dreams yeah, and, and vision just, and, and how many different things he's done at once uh-huh. and other people do it too. Like people like Martha Stewart's done that and still does that. Although she's certainly enjoying herself more these days. Mm. Uh, I can tell that from her social media <laughs> and, uh, or what Steve jobs was able to do. Yeah, I was going to say, that's who I thought of and, Steve jobs. Yep. And, you know, so you actually can do a lot of things. And there's another thing too, that some of my greatest successes when I, did, when I moved, my my company from Philadelphia to New York, uh-huh. um, and I bought the space that we're in. We're right now in Jive Records Recording Studio. Whoa! I, I, come on. So this is marketed today at eight thousand square feet. But uh-huh. with a laser measure, it's you know the interior usable square feet is over six thousand. And I bought this in. I struck the deal in 2009 uh-huh. when half the caters went out of business hmm. and I got a small business loan and I, bu- I was able to buy it. And that was almost an impossible thing. Everyone said, you will never be able to do that because they're like, you have to either rent a floor mm. or you have to own the whole building. They'll yeah. never let a cater put all the gas lines, drains, vents, all the things you need, electric. And I was able to do that. And that was very lucky. But, um, and I, Sony Music is who I bought it from, who yeah. had bought Jive Records. Jive Records, yeah. This was where Britney and, and Justin cut their biggest hits. Yeah. This floor and the one below. They owned the whole building, uh-huh. basically. But, anyways, the real point of the story was when I bought this, it was very complicated when I signed the deal and to get it built and to get the financing done. I was also doing my first book. Had At no the idea. Same time. Had no idea how to do either. And moving my whole business <laughs> from Philadelphia to New York, right? <laughs> I'm like and overwhelmed. I, and by the way, I did not have really a strong team at that time because also the team was mostly in Philadelphia and a lot of them didn't want to move. So they My knew this was God. coming there. You know, people are looking to, you know, oh, and yeah. so anyways, that was like what I call a free fall or the other thing that we're not talking about is getting out of your comfort zone. Oh yeah. Out of my, and, and it also is letting go control me. I was in a free fall and, uh, and two of my greatest successes came out of that. My first book, and then also having this man, I love how the way that you're, um, the way you're, you're, you're talking about this. I love it. You're in the, like you say, you're in the middle of a free fall. Were you feeling, uh, maybe this is a naive question, but were you feeling a lot of fear at the time? So like I went down to Florida, like over presence weekend, X number of years ago, right after I'd signed this and a good friend of mine, a girl said to me, she's like, Peter, I know you bought that place in, in New York. I'm just looking at you. You need to take some Valium. <laughs> <laughs> I'd literally be walking on the beach Andy, and I'd be like, okay, if I rented my house on Nantucket or if I, or I just may have to sell it. So I had, you know, I had the ability to absorb the downside. Yeah. So the worst case scenario, okay, okay. you know, and but still uh, it's but scary no, no. as hell. Oh, it was scary. And then the contractors in New York, forget about <laughs> I it. I can't even think you of just that. just can't even imagine what they said to me. Uh-huh. Oh, what have you gotten yourself into? <laughs> you know, this is going to cost you young man. Uh huh. Oh, man. Oh, my God. Well, it's worked. It's worked. It worked. Well, but I imagine, you know, the way you're built, I can relate to this, too. You know, if you're if, if you're the kind of soul who leaps off that cliff without seeing a net, you know, maybe trusting or having no idea, but then it appears that never ends. Right. That's just kind of part of your character of your personality. Right. You'll do this to the very end. I feel like I will. Yeah. Well, it's I'm- exciting, too. It's exciting. It's inspiring. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, like where, where is everyone in, in their, in their stage of their life? Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, when you've reached a certain amount of success, whether you're an entertainment company like you are, or you're an event planner, you're a decorator, you're a caterer at a certain point, a lot of us sort of hit a glass ceiling. Mm. And by that, your, your business is sort of the same size because there's only so much you can do. So you're either going to build out a group of people mm-hmm. and which not all of us are that great at. Um, I certainly wasn't. Sounds like you have been now. And, well, and it, ooh, it took a lot of work, a lot of bumps in the road. I hear you. Mm. And, but part of it is, so how do you do that? And that's part of, you know, and you've, you've done it. And I think you're, you're a great, 
uh, you know, you're a great example. And I mean, you know, by the way, you could probably be a consultant Andy, because <laughs> everyone else wants to find out. Tell me how to do it. I'm feeling this way today, Andy. Huh? What's the deal? All right. Here's Knock my email. Off. Call me. Knock it off, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love what you're talking about. And, and I mean, oh, we got to have fun. I mean, got to have fun. I, it, oh. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm about to take people get so pissed at me when I talk about it. I'm about to take another month. I'm going to go for the month of March. And again, I built a wonderful team led by this person, Rebecca, wonderful and Lauren and I, I could go on and on. And uh, it's scary. I have a little bit of queasiness in the stomach. But I know, Peter, like you were saying when you went uh, to the beach and you, t- you were able to see it differently. I know when I can get away, slow down again, that's where I have gotten so many ideas. And that's a leap off a cliff too, to be able to separate like that for a a big moment from the business, you know? Yeah, that's, and you are right about making the time and that that's where you have some of your greatest successes about creativity and moving forward. Um, And that's interesting you say that because it is so important to make time for yourself. And sometimes it seems counterintuitive because The business is always there. There's always something you could be working on, but you do have to come up with this that I'm not going to work and that I'm going to take that time off. But then you do have to balance it with having the team so that you have have the revenue, you have the company you need to do. And that's a real balancing act. I mean, it really is. Yeah, it is. Do you know one thing that kind of drives me lately makes me think, you know how people say the cliche, life is so short, right? Life is so, there's a comedian, a certain comedian who said it so differently and it's really affects me. Um, he said, you're going to be dead way longer than you're going to be alive. And somehow that grabbed me. Somehow that grabbed me. Yeah, we all have our, our moments like that. And I, I, that's a good one. And so I had one one time. I, I thought I was being, you know, I, well, I don't know what I was doing, but I was talking to a client and one far more successful than me. He was the president of one of the largest golf equipment companies in the world. Yeah. And I was, it was doing the setup of this party and I was explaining how I have this very small boat, nothing at all, the one I used to have. And, and I was saying, you know, I didn't put it in the, in the water this summer because it cost this amount a year. And I only used it this many times last, last year. And so it cost me this amount of times every time I used it. And the guy turned over to me, he goes like, Peter, put the damn boat in the water. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't a dress rehearsal. Right. He's like, I was out in, I, I don't use my boat either much, Peter, but I was out in Gardner's Bay and I was out there and what that experience and that day mm. did for me yep. is priceless. Yes. Put the damn boat yes. in the water and stop, you know, cause it's not a dress rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, you know, my family, I, you know, both my parents passed away. And then you really mm. start thinking about your mortality. Mm. My dad passed away about a year ago and it was all good. It was his time to go. But, you know, all of a sudden it's like, holy cow. Yeah, it you happens. Know, I've got a yeah. finite amount of time mm-hmm. left on this earth. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, how are we going to use it? And you don't want the, you don't want the, we want the no regrets. Yeah. Right. We want no regrets. And, uh, and I think too, you've got to say like, what do you want to be doing? But I will say, you know, another interesting thing, my dad retired when he was 49. So I had this wow. thing over me, you know, and he wonder, he worked so he could sail. Uh-huh. And he sailed a lot, man, when he yeah, retired. That's great. But anyways, you know, but a lot of my clients that are, you know, the most happy and also the most successful by, you know, people like Carl Icahn, you know, they work and they still love it. But they're working on their own terms. Mm. And I think that's what we're really talking mm-hmm. about here. You want to work on your own terms. And, uh, you know, I right now am working on creating some things and it's sort of like, I'll give the, you know, a little sort of like teaser, Please, but so my biggest creative thing has been all the mini comfort food, mini drinks paired with the mini comfort food, the customized trays, accessories that go with the trays, mini pizza boxes. And I created the donut wall, by the way, like that one. Oh yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the donut wall, but that went viral. You know, we could talk about patents another time, and, uh, <laughs> but I'm about to have what I'm hoping is my biggest, most creative moment. And it's the, what I'm going to do with my business. Yeah. And 
because I want to do a massive transformation Jeez. of what I do in catering and what I'm going to do in a related thing. And I'm going to be doing that while I take care of my clients, Andy. So any of you clients <laughs> out there that are listening, don't worry. don't worry. Your wedding's going to be good oh, because man. I know if it's not, I can't do anything. Man, you've, uh, you've Especially I won't be able to learn kiteboarding. <laughs> Kite surfing, I think Kite, is what yeah, it's okay, called, sir. Excuse me. But, okay, well, you know, <laughs> mister, I'm going for a month to, to Maui. <laughs> well, that's I guess how you I do know. know. <laughs> Listen, wow, you have created quite a cliffhanger. You know, this is what I'm going to want to do. How long is this going to take, do you think, by the way, for this? Well, I'm trying to do phase one yeah. by the spring. Okay. And if it's not by the spring, that it will open by the fall. Yeah. And what we're doing right now, if anyone wants to help this out there listening, <laughs> there's a lot of good ideas out there in the world. So we're trying to make sure that when we open, we open with a bang. We Whoa. want the world to hear it. Yeah. We want the world to support it huh. because I'm doing something very very counterintuitive. <laughs> I love it's it. Good. So, please. It's very counterintuitive. You uh -huh. know what it also is doing, Andy? Yes. It's doing a lot. It's going to do a lot of good. This oh, is going to huh. be something that is going to be a karmic thing where and I, I, it only is going to work if it goes big either. So I'm banking on going really big on this <laughs> and i but i need the world to support me mm. so that's what we're working on right now i hired a guy full time uh -huh. to work only on this we don't drag him into anything else yeah and i'm directing him and we're going really big you have created such a cliffhanger here all right here's the deal I want to be a part of this in this way. When the time comes, you call me. I want to get together back on the microphones again. And when you're able to talk about it and let's do it, man, let's announce it to the world here. And, you know, I would love to do that. And I'll tell you that, like, you know, if it works, yeah. it may be a great model for everyone. That's the other thing. Hmm. We all need help, man. Yeah. And we all need a good roadmap. And this could be a really good roadmap. Wow. For a lot of people. Yeah. And something where, you know, you can go big and help the world at the same time. Mm, I love that. I love that. Yeah. So like I, I was, and I shared it with a, with a woman the other morning, yesterday morning, right? Uh -huh. I've known her brother-in-law for years. He's one of the wealthiest people in the world and one of the biggest philanthropists trying to help the world. And I told his sister-in-law and who I was just meeting for about a party. And she was like, that's a really beautiful thing. Mm. You know, good luck. It's like, well, I need a little more luck. <laughs> I need a little help here. Well, Peter, if anyone could shake it up, it's you. I mean, I'm knocked out. This has been a blast of a conversation. I've Thank really, you, yeah. I mean, I'm feeling inspired. It's like, oh, cool. I, I'm like exploding <laughs> with things I got to do here. But, um, but thank you for being on the show and sharing of yourself like this. And again, we're going to definitely have you back on again sometime. Okay, cool. Well, I would love that. Man, great. Good. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. This has been The Wedding Biz with Andy Kushner. You can find us at theweddingbiz.com and on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Wedding Biz Show. I gave you my heart. If you want to support the show, we'd be grateful if you shared it with colleagues, friends, and family. We'd also appreciate your review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. It'll never shatter, no matter what we go through. I gave Cause you made